Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service today, the end of August. Where has it gone? I don't know. Whether you're in person or online, we do welcome you today. No matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. A number of announcements to share with you today. First of all, please sign the registers, if you will, at this time and pass those. And we have joyful noise here again today. And Brian keeps uh, working on joyful noise and it gets better every month. So we have a couple of special soloists today that are very good, or one and another singer. And so uh, thank you, Brian, for doing that. David is our liturgist today, so thank you. And your bulletin insert has all kinds of announcements. I do want to go through the church calendar uh, for those online as well who aren't looking at it. Uh, September 9th, next Saturday, two Saturdays from now, uh, is the return of Zoom Faith Forum. So if you'd like to be a part of that, it's Saturday at 10, and we're going to talk about Noah's Ark the first time. So if you're interested, see me afterwards, we'll add you. It's a lively group. You don't have to talk unless you want to. Matter of fact, it's such a talkative group that it's probably better if you don't talk very much because uh, <laughs> they, they are very, uh, very good at talking. So uh, September 24th is our church anniversary Sunday with conference staff. This will be number 143? Yeah, 143 years for our church in September. So we look forward to that. Uh, the Blessing of the Animals, October 4th. October 19th, Halloween open house at our home on Mount Vernon. Uh, if you can't come during those two hours, uh, particularly if you're a child, come Halloween night. Uh, anybody else is also uh, welcome to stop by Halloween night as well. Uh, for those online that don't know, uh, our street is one of the Halloween streets, and so we all have to go crazy with decorating, and so we'll look forward to that. Uh, Prescott Community Covered 50th Anniversary Celebration, October 28th. And October 29th, new members will be received. So that's a lot to digest. Uh, please take this with you and keep those dates in mind. August Mission, we come to our last Sunday for the DACA Fund and Prescott College's Freedom Education Fund. So please support those if you will. Uh, SUP with Seven is planning another round of dinners and homes. A sign-up sheet is in Perkins Hall. Women of Courage is coming up uh, on September 5th. At 7 o'clock, our own Sandy is a part of that uh, choir. And so look at that and attend if you can. And uh, at the very bottom of the back, we have Launch Pads Trek 14. Uh, Andy is not here today, but he plans to try to raise money by doing, what is he doing? He's doing the, ooh, Grand Canyon Rim to Rim, 24 miles. Pray for Andy to uh, <laughs> be able to do that. But uh, anyway, I'm sure we all want to support him in that, and Launchpad is a great organization, so we'll look forward to that as well. Okay, that's a lot of announcements, and now we come to a very important time in the life of the church, and that is the baptism of Henry Michael. And so I'm going to ask uh, Henry if you will come up here and stand right here on this side. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, heard, I, I even went over this, and he remembers, and I don't. So, yes, right there is good. And uh, parents, if you want to come up, and Andrea and Andy and Aaron. <laughs> Got too many, <laughs> too many names on my mind. Um, you know, uh, Henry has been such a joy to this congregation. He, uh, is it two years now? Maybe after COVID, um, Henry started showing up and he is just a delight. I don't know who wants to take credit for his personality, you know, <laughs> grandparents, parents, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, he's just been a delight to our congregation. And I'm going to, uh, you know, part of baptism is belonging. It's, it's how you belong to the church, part of Christ Church and this local church. Uh, but Henry's already really doing all of that. He is a member here already in terms of what he does. I joked with him that he's doing the hardest job in the church, which is lighting the candles. 
But did you notice from when he started to now how it's like a breeze anymore? You know? It, he was, uh, <laughs> I think when he came, he was probably about this high. And so it was hard to get up there, you know, to get the candles. But now it's easy. So uh, he does that. He's part of uh, our youth, what they do with Vacation Bible School, with plays. And he's also done liturgy, I think, uh, here as well. So uh, he's already basically a member. We're just validating that today and welcoming him. Uh, but uh, Jesus said, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them uh, to do whatever it is that I have shared with you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the world. And so we baptize because of the command of Jesus first and foremost. Uh, baptism is one of our two sacraments. A sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible grace. So we have Holy Communion and baptism. Holy Communion reminds us with the elements of the fa uh, fact that Jesus gave his life for us. And baptism with water symbolizes for us birth and new birth and being part of the family of God. And so uh, we come now to this water to be reminded of the importance of baptism, of joining the church, and being one with the family of God. A couple of other questions to ask before we do the baptism. Part of baptism, although Henry's sort of in the middle of being, you know, he's not young, he's not uh, 18 yet, but he's able to think and make his own deci decisions. And, as I shared with him, uh, if I ask all of us to give all the details about baptism, we may be you know, about where Henry is in terms of our ability to understand it and think about it. And so, um, but uh, part of baptism is the family joining together and putting their arms around you and supporting you. And so I'm going to ask your parents, you promise to help Henry as he grows in his Christian faith to be with him, to support him, and encourage him along the way, do you? Yes. There is quite a family contingent here today, and we thank you all for coming, so I'll ask you to stand, if you will. And uh, part of this is family support, which we have a lot of that going on today as well, and so I ask all of you, will you do your best to help Henry as he grows, to support him, and be with him, and encourage him in his Christian faith, do you? Thank you. You may be seated. And the congregation. I won't ask you to stand, but uh, you all know that part of this is all of you joining together and supporting Henry along the way. And so if you promise to support Henry and encourage him as he's a part of us here in this family of God, uh, will you do that? Will you? Yes. Thank you. You know, Henry, I was thinking this morning, uh, one of the things that uh, I remember most from my early time in the church, I was in the Methodist church, and I was a friend of the pastor's son, and so he had access, you know, to everything. And so my only memory of that is running around with him in the church. I don't remember anything the pastor said, <laughs> but the power of that is uh, still with me to this day, that I did that, and it was such a joy. I say that because I enjoy seeing Henry run around the church and uh, take part here, and so that's one of the things he'll remember. And so uh, God bless you now as you become a member of our church. Do you promise to follow in the way of Jesus, do you? You promise to be a faithful member here as you have opportunity and you're already doing all of that. You know, actions uh, speak louder than words and so your actions precede you. But I'll still ask you the question, uh, do you want to be a faithful member of this church, do you? Yes. God bless you. Let us pray together. Oh God, we come to this font now and uh, it is the blessing of new life. It is the blessing of belonging. It is the blessing of being part of this family of faith and of Christ's family worldwide. And so be present with us now through the power of your spirit and bless 
Henry as he receives baptism today that your spirit might reside on him and lead him forth in his growth in faith. Through Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Henry Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You are Christ's child, a child of the covenant, a member of this church, and a member of Christ's church worldwide. God bless you, and be with you, and let us pray one more time. Thank you, God, for Henry, and ask your blessings on him. And may we, as the family of faith, support and encourage him through his years ahead. We pray through Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. And now we all get to stand and greet one another and greet Henry as he's now a part of this family of faith. <laughs> Please share the peace of Christ with one another.
Thank you. Okay, if you're visiting with us, we always have a children's time, whether we have 10 children, two, sometimes none. <laughs> we never know what's going on in their lives, but we have some here today. And our uh, animal friends are increasing by the week. <laughs> We've got all kinds of animals. But uh, anyway, we always have this time, and JJ and Ziggy always help us out somehow. And so, uh, let me see, they have, uh, what have they done? Oh, they're all tied up. <laughs> you all know what a pun is? <laughs> you do now? Yeah, they're all tied up with neckties, yeah. So another pun, I thought, uh, well, I gotta have something else to say. So, um, does uh, February March in other words, does February, March? Well, April, May. <laughs> so that's another pun. So a pun is just a, a play on words. And so yeah, they're all tied up today. Well, why would they be all tied up? Well, Jesus is gonna talk about how um, he was always kind of going against the religious leaders of his day because they were trying to tie people up with all kinds of ex extra commandments and things that God didn't really want them to do, but the religious leaders thought they should, and so they were what we call binding them, tying them up with extra rules. And so Jesus came along, and he untied them. He unbound them from those things that uh, were trying to keep them from where God wanted them to be. Well, how to explain that uh, down on a personal level? You know, as we go through life, people try to give us names. They try to peg things on us. My name was Wishy Washy Wilcher. Because <laughs> I tried to play basketball and I was so terrified, they'd try to pass me the ball and I would be like, yeah, don't pass it to me. And so the coach said, you're too Wishy Washy Wilcher. And as you might imagine, that became a nickname that I had to deal with, but that's a, an example of trying to tie me with something, to try to say, this is what you're like, and I, and I knew that deep down, that's not what I'm like at all, but they tried to tie that to me, and so God is always releasing us from these ties that people try to give us, and so may God help you to always listen to God, listen to the voice of God, and don't let people put you in their own little binds or their ties. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for our boys and girls. Bless them today. Be with them. Help them as they grow to look to you for who they are. They are loved. They are blessed. They are truly, uniquely gifted by you. And so help them to explore those gifts and develop them and not let other people put them in any kind of place. We pray all of this through Christ. Amen. Thank you all for being here, and you may now... Head off. I have some ties for sale if anybody <laughs> wants to. Uh, yeah, you could have a tie. <laughs> I, I, did, I haven't said this in a while, but I, uh, I used to be in, in banking, and so I have uh, like 100 ties, and I don't know what to do with them anymore because no one wears a tie. So I try to find ways to reduce my burden. <laughs> Great. Well, would you join me in the uh, words of greeting and call to prayer, respond in the bold print, if you would? Let us give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts, bowing down to sing God's praise. Let us give thanks to God's name for steadfast love and faithfulness. We have called, and God has answered increasing the strength of our souls. Let us all sing the ways of the Lord, who is great in glory. Though God is high above all, God looks with care upon the lowly. Outstretch hand, save us, and complete God's purpose for us. God's steadfast love endures forever. 
And if you care to stand, we'll sing in the New Century hymnal number 73. Loving God, we come to you in humble awe of who you are. We worship you this morning with songs, voice, and prayers. We adore you with our love, praise, and thanksgiving. Thank you for all you are doing and in through your church. Churches that were once dying are now alive and growing. Churches become unhealthy are now healthy again. Churches that had become turned inward are now turned outward. Churches that were in hospital have become inward. We thank you for what you are doing in our own lives. Growing us, growing us to be more like Jesus. Feed us in this worship service that we may continue to grow and love. Amen. Okay, let's go into God's Word, um, Romans 12, um, which will be primarily dealt with next week by Pastor Jay. Um, and is concerned with building the church with the gifts of the Spirit. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may, be so you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members 
one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, and the compassionate in carefulness. <clears throat> And then Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the word of the Lord. And the hymn. <laughs> if you can stand again, uh, we'll sing in that little book, um, Prayer and Praise 165. <clears throat> Yeah. 
seated. It's important for this passage today from Matthew's Gospel that we understand a little bit about Caesarea Philippi. It was located in the very northern regions of Israel, uh, sort of one of those cities that uh, wasn't in the heart of the faith, and so being that far north was very cosmopolitan <coughs> with other kinds of faiths going on. And so Jesus takes his disciples to that city and there is in that city the Greek god Pan, who uh, Pan's grotto is still there. Uh, there is the title of the city, which is named after Caesar. And then uh, Philip came along and renamed it Caesarea Philippi, so that he could get his name in there. And so you have a combination of religious uh, idols, gods, uh, other faiths there, and you have the powerful rulers there. And so it's in the midst of this context that Jesus asks this important question. Who do people say that I am? And notice the interesting answers he gets there. They still haven't a clue who he is at this point, and so they name a bunch of different people. And then comes the important question, ah, but who do you say that I am? And so if I was going to ask you that today, who do you say that I am? What would you say? We're in a congregational church. We have freedom of belief here. And so I imagine if I asked this whole congregation, I don't know how many different answers we would get to that question, but I'm pretty sure we wouldn't all be on the same page. Who do you say that I am? Now, it's a lot easier if in, we're in one of those churches that is a creedal church that would have a creed for us. Matter of fact, in the back of your hymnal, you have some creeds. 881 is the page number, and many of us grew up in churches where we had to recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, buried, descended into hell, third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. The Apostles' Creed. So <laughs> some of us have it uh, sort of buried deep within us. And so uh, it goes from there to the Nicene Creed, which is one that uh, really the universal church sort of uh, joins together in affirming. Uh, but these creeds have statements about Jesus that are included there, and so very easy if you're in one of those churches. You just quote that. You may not understand half of it, but, you know, you can quote it and say this is who Jesus is. The reality is, I think, as we grow, we change, and so who Jesus is for us may change with time. I was thinking this week that Jesus for me when I was a fundamental Baptist was Jesus in me, right? Uh, Jesus is for me. Jesus gets me my parking spot at the grocery store, all those kind of things. But as I've grown older and changed, I often think of Jesus as for others. Jesus is for the refugees at the border. Uh, Jesus is for the people of Ukraine who are going through a whole, uh, horrible time. Uh, Jesus is for the down and out, uh, the DACA students who should get citizenship, and they don't. And so I, I've kind of changed in some ways my view of Jesus, not so much centered in me, but uh, what is Jesus up to in the world, and how can I follow in the way of Jesus as I go try to follow him? And so. Wherever you are on the spectrum, you're welcome here. We have people who think of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and we have others who think of Jesus as a, a wonderful prophet, whatever the case might be, but we're all coming from a different angle, and that's okay. We don't have a statement that you have to sign here. We don't have to uh, accede to certain statements in order to be a part of this church. And I got to thinking this week that even the Gospels present us a little bit different pictures of Jesus. Um, you have Mark, a very short, quick gospel. Jesus is active. 
You have Matthew, more of a Jewish sort of gospel. Uh, as I've said in past weeks, Jesus is not as happy as he is in other gospels there. He's got a lot of stern things to say. Uh, Luke, Jesus has a concern for the poor, cares about the needy, has a place for women in uh, his gospel. And then you come to John, which I think is the greatest example. Uh, what's the Christmas story in John's gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's no baby in the manger. There's the eternal Christ who comes and fleshed in Jesus to show us the way of God. And so even in the Gospels, there are different ways of uh, looking at Jesus. And so who do you say that I am? It's an important question, one for you to answer. But for Peter, it was clear. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, On this rock I will build my church. Ah, that statement has created through the centuries a lot of different ideas. I want to just quote uh, briefly from an article in the Interpretation Journal uh, by Jack Suggs, who was the dean of Bright Divinity School, Texas Christian University. And here's what he says as he begins to interpret this passage. Coming to Matthew 16, 13 through 20 is a bit like visiting a Civil War historical site. It's an old ex exegetical battleground where both Protestant and Roman Catholic theologians have raged in conflict, but which has now grown quiet. I'm sure this past week you didn't go to the local tea, uh, tea shop or coffee shop and have an argument with somebody about uh, whether Peter was the first pope and the succession of the popes, or whether the rock that he's talking about there is the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But this has divided the church for millennia. Uh, Catholics, of course, have taken it that Peter is the first pope. He was the founding of the church, and the succession came from him. Protestants have said, no, the, the, the rock there is the confession. And we believe the church is built on that confession of Jesus as the Christ. We don't really have that big argument anymore. And as he suggests in the uh, article, we sort of have come to a, an appreciation of both sides, really. Uh, it's no doubt that Peter was uh, very important in the early church, perhaps the leader in the early church, which is why that the text tells us that Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. If you look at your bulletin front, you have a, a depiction there from the Sistine Chapel of uh, Jesus giving Peter the key. <laughs> it's a massive key in that uh, artistic rendering. Uh, but yeah, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. What in the world does that mean? Well, scholars point out that I think it's right that uh, the key has to do with interpreting the message of Jesus. It has to do with interpreting what Jesus said and giving it to the people. That's the key. It's not uh, physically locking the door so people can't come in. Give you the keys to the kingdom. Peter is often presented to us as uh, the one that we see at the pearly gates, right? And all the jokes are all the same. We get to the pearly gates and there is Peter. And it really comes from this passage where he is, uh, has the keys to heaven and will let us in. And so the jokes are endless. I'll give you one this morning just for a little uh, humor. Uh, uh, two people came to the pearly gates and they had got to know each other and they decided to get married. And so they asked uh, Peter, could we get married as we come into heaven? 
And Peter looked kind of flustered, and he said, all right, let me go see if I can find somebody. We really haven't had any uh, Anybody want to get married in heaven? They're actually glad marriage has gone away. No, don't say amen to that. So anyway, uh, they <laughs> so Peter goes off, tries to find somebody to marry them. Comes back in about a month, and he said, "I finally found a priest." Uh, so, <laughs> so they said, uh, "Great." But we've had another question now. Um, if it doesn't work out, we want a divorce. Can we get divorced? And Peter throws up his hands, all right, let me go look for some, an attorney. And so he goes off, and he's gone for a long time. And he finally comes back and said, uh, man, it took long enough to find a priest. It took twice as long to find an attorney. <laughs> so there's just endless uh, jokes about Peter at the pearly gates, but it really comes from this text where he is the one that has given the keys to the kingdom. Again, most scholars would suggest that this is the key to interpret that which is given by Jesus. And then he goes on to say, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so Peter is given the key to binding and loosing. What does that mean? Well, uh, scholars would again say that it means that uh, it's the, the key to interpret that which Jesus has said is binding and not binding. And if you know anything about the uh, ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, he was forever in conflict with the religious leaders who were forever trying to bind people. And Jesus was forever arguing with them to loose and the 613 laws that they came up with, these were laws that they put around the true law so that before you got to the true law, you would break one of these 613 commandments, right? So you really wouldn't be breaking the law. So it was a protective measure. But what did it do to the people? It bound them severely. And so Jesus was always in conflict with them to say, that's not right. The Sabbath was made for us, not us for the Sabbath. And it went on and on like that. Um, but Jesus was in the ministry of loosing all of these binds that the religious leaders had placed on people. And so as I suggested in the newsletter this week, uh, maybe one of the applications of this passage for us is that we live in a time, certainly, of binding. There's a lot of binding going on, a lot of people who want to bind and tie people up with all kinds of rules and regulations and beliefs, and it is maybe our ministry to be in the loosing business, to loose people from that which has bound them. And we see that year after year in the ministry of this church where people come in They've been bound by the religious dogma that's been given to them, the teachings that have been given to them that won't allow them to be who they are, that have them in all kinds of strange beliefs, and they come in and are loosed in grace, finally able to believe in a God of love, a God of acceptance, and a God who will be with them through their lives. And that's, a, I think, a very practical aspect of this text. We are in the loosing business in a very binding area. Who do you say that I am? May we all answer that question to the best of our ability today, and may we be in the business of Lucy. If you guys know the chorus to this, please sing with us.
Example, by the way, of uh, what's that? We can't hear you. Oh, am I off again? Okay, you're on. No. Well, I should be on. Hmm. All right. How about that? Better? Maybe. <laughs> so I was going to say uh, that's a good example of. Uh, how uh, we've changed in the Protestant church. We've gone from, uh, you know, we wouldn't sing about Mary 50 years ago, and we wouldn't talk about how Peter is uh, very prominent in the church. Uh, so a lot of change has gone on in recent decades. Well, we come to our morning prayer time, and uh, I want to begin by just noting the fact, if you've watched the news this weekend, that there were nine mass shootings, five dead and 56 injured in our country. Sometimes it's just uh, overwhelming to think about uh, all kinds of different places and events that went on, including the racial uh, uh, deaths down in uh, Florida from this uh, racist individual. So we want to pray for our nation and for some solution to this constant killing. We want to pray for Maui, for Ukraine, uh, for uh, all the things that you bring with you today, all the requests that you want to share in this time ahead. And Edie's going to have surgery this week, and so we want to pray for her that uh, might go well, and she will be on the road to recovery soon. So let's pray for all of these uh, prayer request today and those things that you bring on your hearts. Let us join together in prayer. Oh God, we lift up to you today the requests that uh, I have mentioned. Uh, we do pray for our nation, which seems uh, to just endlessly talk about these shootings. Uh, we pray that uh, there might be some solution, some way to, to make uh, peace and people living together happen more and more. Uh, we do pray for our nation that uh, you would help us to find solutions. And we pray for Ukraine today. And we pray for uh, those on our hearts that we bring with us. Oh God, in the quiet of these moments, we lift up to you the unspoken requests that we all have. We pray for Edie that you might be the great physician for her this week. Thank you for others who are recovering. And again, we give you thanks for our blessings, the blessings of life that we enjoy. We pray this through Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship now in our giving. I'll ask the ushers to come at this time. Dear God, would you join with me, please? Dear God, you have offered us a place at the table, and you have called us to share without expectation of being repaid. You have called us to make a place for the poor, the outcast, and the oppressed. So we ask that you bless these resources so that they must support ministry of compassion justice until all your children have a place at the table. Amen. If you would remain standing and sing in the prayer and praise book 199. <clears throat>
for being with us today. We do invite you next door to a time of fellowship. Uh, we do have communion down front after the service. If you wish to come up and receive that, please do so. Uh, welcome to our special family today, so greet them after the service. And Henry, the star, will be coming up from downstairs <laughs> shortly, so uh, please greet him as well. Well, may you go forth to loose to let people free from that which binds them. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen.